I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the Power Platform Show. Thanks for joining me today. I hope today's guest inspires and educates you on the possibilities of the Microsoft Power Platform. Now, let's get on with the show. Okay, welcome everybody. It's good to kick off the show. Let's start with who we are. Why don't, I mean, I think that's a good place to start. So, Andrew, why don't we start with you? Thank you for the honor. So, um, I'm Andrew Welch. I uh, live in London. I'm originally from uh, the United States uh, on Cape Cod, and I am the CTO for cloud services at uh, a Microsoft partner called HSO, uh, and you can find us all around the world. Fantastic. If you had one superpower, but only five minutes a day, what would it be and why? Fuck, I have no idea. <laughs> that's, that's your superpower. I love it. The, the, everything. <laughs> Can you ask me that question later? I got, I, I got nothing. I'm not, yeah, a super I, I'm not a super, I'm not a superpower guy. I already, I already got, I already got all I need. Okay. 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 Modesty then. <clears throat> Mr. Huntingford. Yo, what's up? So my name is Chris. I'm the currently the low code lead at a company called ANS. Uh, we're in Manchester and I've just moved to glorious Cambridge where I will be living, well, am living very close to Mr. Dorrington. And yeah, I get to run around and tell people how epic uh, low code and ecosystem enablement is. That's nice, nice. Yeah. If you could be one kitchen appliance, what would it be and why? Definitely a whisk, but one of those double whisks that mi like mix up together. The reason is because, number one, they are literally the most useful things. Also, if I could replace my hands, it would be with tiny whisks, like many of them. And I'd be whisk man, like run around just whisking stuff for people. That's why. I just think it's, whisks are the most important thing. Also, I have a thing for spatulas, but like proper spatulas with a little hook on the end that lift the egg over for you. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you. Anna. Hi, I'm Anna Demeni. I also live in London. In fact, very close to Andrew Welch. <laughs> I come from Romania and I am a cloud solution architect for Microsoft. <laughs> Every day I get to explore new technology and help people implement it. So that's really, really cool. Nice. If you could eat only one food for the rest of your life and it would never impact you negatively, what would it be? Bread and butter. Not cake, huh? I thought you, I thought you were going to go with cake. No. Nope. You know, the super good bread and butter at high-end restaurants. Like when you go oh, yeah. and pay a lot of money to have the tasting menu, but secretly only desire the bread and butter. Yep, that's me. <laughs> hot rolls, hot rolls. Hot rolls, indeed. <laughs> Mr. Dorrington. Hi, Mark. Great to be here. So my name's William Dorrington. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Curve Digital. And as Chris said, I live up in Cambridge only as stones throw away from him and our good friend Carl Hill, who I'm sure will probably get on here at some point, although we will have to drag him on. Fantastic. If you could write a book about your life, what would the title be? I'm here now. <laughs> Amazing. Are you? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, Perfect. Hold on. Love it. Love it. See, I could have answered that question. You could have. Yeah. Well, that's why I didn't give it to you, right, Andrew? <laughs> Andrew, sorry, you missed yours. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, gone. It's fine. I know. It's done. And to wrap things up, my name is Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365Guy. And we are here to have some fun. And if I was to ask myself a question, which I haven't even pre-read, it is if I could have dinner with any three people, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Those three people would be, I feel Einstein would have to be one of them. I feel Tesla, without a doubt, would have to be one of them and let him know why he got screwed over. And I think the third one, no, that's too controversial. I won't use that guy. I think the the last one would be uh, Norma Jean. Oh. Yeah. 
are the four of you dining together at the same like at the same time, same place, or are you having dinner with each of them one-on-one? I would prefer one-on-ones, right, because then you can really drill into the individual's perspective on things. What would you serve Einstein? Or are you going to go out for dinner? I would expect he was cooking. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it, it would be at his house, right? So, yeah. yeah for sure. <laughs> How foolish of me. <laughs> I would be the guest of honour. <laughs> I, you're like Einstein. You, you chose me as your guest, and I'm here now. You get to ask me three questions. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that's it. To give a little bit background, and why are we here? Why are we doing this little mini series? And wherever it takes us, it'll take us. How did this come about? Yeah, this is a, this is a bit of a story, I think. I can I can take the first bit if you want. I can show the video. I can show the video of of you and Mr. Oh. Walsh. And uh, where was it? We were in uh, no, we were in Faro, Portugal, yeah, and we yeah, just yeah. wined and dined ourselves. And then we called yeah. you, Mark Smith. That, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it was a great idea. We'd um, we'd had a couple of chats kind of in the day, and um, yeah, we just thought, hey, you know what? Maybe after a ton of beer we should phone mark right andrew and i had been speaking for a little bit and then obviously anna anna managed to climb in as well which has been epic and we were talking about the concepts of enablement and why we think that effectively digital transformation is dead we needed to find a way to take a little further and we thought well one of the things we should be doing is actually spreading this a little bit further than just our own minds so yeah this is why we're here now and i think you know, we'd want to grow this a little bit more by kind of trying to build the market around ecosystem enablement. But yeah, this is something we need to talk about because I believe that if we don't get this right this time around, we're going to be in a lot of trouble in the next 10 years, especially yeah. as AI takes takes over. Yeah. So this is why we're here. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that you, you have to remember, or the way that I think about this is that almost everybody out there, um, uh, technology vendors like Microsoft, uh technology partners, consultancies, and end customers have for a very long time been focused on all of the wrong things, and they've missed a lot of opportunities. And I think that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this um, as this series goes on. But a, a good way to think of the moment that we're living in now is if you look back at, say, go back to the dawn of the consumer internet. So we'll peg this at around 1996. And you go from the origination of the browser and the consumer internet to what at the time we called Web 2.0, which now seems just like such a ridiculous phrase. And then into the rise of the public cloud, say in the 2012, 2013, 2014 period, each of those major innovations, those major sea changes in um, in the, the technology world happened, they had about a wave period of, say, eight to 10 years. And that's the period between the crest of each wave. So there was a lot of time for organizations and individuals to get their act together to say, you know, hey, we're going to wait and see what happens. We're going to see how other people do. What's happened since the rise of the public cloud is that these wave periods have gotten shorter. So if you then skip ahead to platform first, and I'm thinking technologies like power platform, low code, um, et cetera, we had maybe four or five years. And now we've had another, say, three, four, five years, and we have the AI wave breaking on the beach. So we're seeing way shorter wave periods uh, between major disruptions in the market. And that is creating the, the conditions where organizations and individuals who don't get with the program much more quickly than they used to are really going to be left behind. Um, we can talk about some data on that as well. But that's, to me, why why we're here. Some say that if you don't catch this wave, that your business will be obliterated by the company, your competitor, that does catch the wave. I genuinely can agree more with that. I mean, it's something that I know all of us have spoken about often. And sort of to paraphrase a bit of Andrew there and to bring in a bit of Chris thinking is, you know, one thing I love about uh, the conversations we have been having up to this initial podcast is we, we do seem to share some sort of hive mentality when it comes to thinking. But if we look at actually just back to on-premise, 
we a, a lot of the aspects around when on-prem came about was us doing to users. So it was always this done to period where you're to take a, a, a you know a large solution and you'll try and retrospectively fit it to to meet some processes, and then you'd throw it out to your users and hope for the best, and they would limp along. And then the cloud came about, and all of a sudden we could do done for, which is actually looking at hey, take a look at all our processes, lay them out, although they didn't bother doing that either, uh, and try and actually just lift and shift to the cloud. But they ignored the fact that they could start applying data gravity. They start, They really ignored the fact that you could start doing interconnected processes. And once again, you could limp along, but it was fine because most of your other competitors were limping with you. Then when it came to platform, we started doing this done with. So we'd actually sit down with our users, we'd start doing you know, user design, experience design, start doing user research. And really we had more of tangible tools to work with our users. But once again, we actually still lost all the advancements we could have had from the uh, cloud period, which is data gravity, actually interconnectivity, not just large ERPs, but applications in general. And then we moved on to low code, no code, which is, should be done by. Once again, we didn't do that. And the next generation's coming soon as well, which is AI and just simply done. And I do worry that once you get to that point, if you can't keep up, like we've seen with Chegg, uh, C-H-E-G-G, -G, shareholders didn't think they could keep up. And at the end of the day, they just crashed overnight because they knew large language models would wipe them out, which they could have actually adopted and they could have become really powerful. It really does worry me, Mark. Sorry, you, you, you hit a point there for me and I went on a, a large ramble. Do apologize. It, no, that's good. That was Will paraphrasing just mm. now. That was an example of Will paraphrasing. So my perspective here is um, quite from a different angle. I'm actually the person nagging everyone to try new technology. I'm there, the little person in the corner, trying the new things, sort of going into detail and then connecting everything together. I'm that person who will say, no, 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 no. You're creating data duplication. That's not going to work. Which means that I get to talk to organizations who are keen to follow new technology and who are keen to follow the money and who are keen to integrate, to actually integrate their systems. So maybe I was fortunate that I didn't really deal with companies who have failed because they haven't followed waves. But on the contrary, I've dealt with companies who were open to change, who were open to learning more and who were open to having their teams sort of talk to each other and create more value for their customers. Because frankly, that brings my bonus up at my job. <laughs> so that's, you know what, that's why I chose them, right? And that's how they got success. So I'm here to sort of talk about the opportunity to enhance that way of seeing things, the opportunity to really look at what's out there and more importantly, what's coming. And I'm really fortunate to be here with you guys who are such great story storytellers because no one notices the guy in the basement creating the AI tools, right? Everyone just looks at the evangelists. So I guess I'm here to say what's going to work and what's not going to work. When it comes to um, a new technology, my bumper sticker for, for Anna is that uh, she will engineer your crazy hopes and dreams. <laughs> Like she will actually make the insanity function correctly. And she's very good at that. That's very cool. AI has come up a few times. <clears throat> Where are we on the adoption curve, right? Do you think we've hit the peak before we go into the valley, valley of, uh, what is it? What's it called? The valley of? Drop of disillusionment. A disillusionment. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Where are we? Where are we at the moment where we're? Six months in, or you know, November last year, twenty twenty two, was when the world became aware of large language models at scale. Where are we yeah. now in the context of that, as an of that curve? I would say we're at you know in a in a battle scene in Game of Thrones when there's a volley of arrows and there's a lot of chaos and no one knows who's doing what to whom and where we are and everyone's just swinging their swords around saying. I will do this. I've got the answer. I will save you. I think we're there right yeah. now. Yeah. Or at the battle in The Last Hobbit, 
same thing. You don't know yes. who's fighting who, who's doing what, <laughs> what's our purpose. One thing that I have noticed was as soon as this started coming out, and, and the me, you know, one thing that things like OpenAI has helped us with is explainability, right? Everyone was really sort of not put off from data science, but because they didn't understand data science. And to be honest, data scientists don't usually understand data science either on top of that. They didn't want to adopt it. But as soon as you can start, you know, writing into, you know, your grandma goes onto a website and goes, get me a cake recipe in the style of Billy Joel Piano Man and sing it to me, you know, and, and it, it brings up this this <laughs> this lovely Billy Joel, you know, cake recipe. Fantastic. You know, all of a sudden they don't care that it's not explainable. But what I noticed from clients at that point was this sudden influx of, you know, really inflated expectations around what this could achieve. And them saying, I want it. I go, great. Where, where's your data then? Well, it's, there's a bit over there. There's a bit over there. And we've got loads all around. They go, okay, can you trust any of that? No. Okay. And you can't get it together. People can't use it to make the right decisions. Well, let's get that in order first before we start looking at clear objectives around this. And that seems to have relaxed a bit now. And I'm starting to see more concise reasoning around why they wish to adopt large language models and other things like propensity models etc so i do think we are getting over that that trough of uh d disillusionment or, or, or whatever we refer to the gartner hype cycle as oh dude i don't know man they're still there but we're seeing some yeah. good people now i think we've underestimated the hype cycle on ai i'll tell you why yes i think what's happened is i think we're going to have several troughs and the way that i think it's going to work i believe is that What's happened is that this thing is just being discovered. I mean, for ChatGPT to become the most popular visited website in the world took not even a day, not even a day, right? I think what we've done is we're going through hype cycle maybe two at the moment. And I think what will happen is there's going to be a dip. There's going to be a trough of disillusionment that I think, Will, you're talking about from a data perspective, when people really figure out that their data is FUBAR. And then I think yeah. there will be another learning curve. And what I think is happening is we are not at the day your data's foobar part. I think we're at the top. We're going to dip very soon. But once people figure out that the data is going, their, their data needs to be fixed, that hype cycle, that the next one is going to be huge. And I think that's when we're going to see some mad disruption. I think that it's really important here to distinguish between the consumer and the organizational, the business or the institutional approach to AI, right? So I think that there's lots of there's lots of hype and and to a large extent it's it's well deserved in the consumer space, right? Because consumers don't have these vast stores of data that institutions have. And a couple of weeks ago in The Economist, uh, they ran an article that was titled Your Employer is Probably Unprepared for Artificial Intelligence. And it talked a little bit about um, how the top firms in, in country after country, the top firms over the last 10, 20 years have pulled away from the bottom firms. So in the United Kingdom, for example, there's been a nearly 11% rise in average worker productivity from 2010 to 2019. But during that same period, the least productive firms saw no rise at all. Um, there's been in Canada a tripling of productivity growth in the most productive versus the least productive firms. So what I think we're on the precipice of is a lot of organizations realizing that they either didn't do enough during previous cycles of innovation or they did they took the easy way out. They did the lazy thing. They focused on the app rather than focusing on the data, rather than focusing on the platform. And they're about to realize that AI is not magic, it just does magical things with your hard work around your data platform. And that, to me, is the trough of disillusionment that most people have not even hit yet because they've been so wrapped up in the consumer wow factor of what they can do with ChatGPT or with Bing. And it's so much more than that. I just wanted to say that, the, that they still are. I am still talking to organizations, some of them pretty big, who are still super focused on the app, who are still super focused on the superficial way of adopting AI, who have not, who have previously uh, sank and nearly drowned in previous waves. They're clearly not prepared for this wave at all. 
but they want to try like the co-pilot preview. <laughs> There's a lot of smoke and mirrors. Mm-hmm. And they are hoping that by trying out these new tools and shouting out that they are to their customers, they're going to win big deals and then they're just going to wing it because no one knows about AI anyway. Mm. That's another way of seeing this dissolution. Will, did you have something to add there? No, no, I was just, uh, sorry, I was, I was finger pointing in excitement. That's yes. what that was, Mark. So yes. everything you said is you know, I, I absolutely agree with and, and see all the time. And it'll always come back to most technology conversations, especially in the Microsoft business platform comes back to how good's your data and do you know where it is? Because that's always every app, even the applications we build, we're either inputting data or moving data about to then report on that data. Data science only allows you to then mine that data for more value. So I, I yeah, I was just in, excitedly agreeing with it. And sorry, I've had a bit of caffeine, so I'm, I'm ready to go now. <laughs> I think something that Will said just now really kind of tipped my brain on this. And listen, you know, full disclosure, everyone, everyone in this room right now has worked for a partner, a consultancy, or currently works for a partner or consultancy. And I think that there is, um, when, when you, Chris and Will love to talk about how we screwed up digital transformation. And I think that there is some culpability here for the network of the sort of the the whole network of individual technologists, experts in the field, and partners who end customers rely on. And almost all parties involved have, we're going to segue, I guess, into the pyramid a bit now, but almost everyone involved with this has spent a couple generations of technology really obsessed with implementing workloads. That's building apps, building end-user solutions, building BI components, implementing Dynamics, implementing Salesforce, SAP, Workday, whatever it is that you are implementing. And the fact is, is that, one, when you, when you are that obsessed with implementing workloads at the expense of the hard work of building proper platforms, you are building a house on atrocious foundations. And now we're in a position where it turns out that the ease of insourcing and reshoring is way higher when we're talking about implementing workloads. And by the way, implementing workloads, that is the thing that is most likely to get eaten in the short term by the combination of AI that can build the app for you and also by citizen developers who can take a lot of that lower complexity work off the hands of developers. So on the one hand, it's a good thing if we're trying to uh, eliminate backlogs, but I also think that we have a whole network of experts that have uh, focused people's attention in the wrong place for way too long. Yeah, I'd agree. I think that, I think that there's been so many people placing value on the deliverable and Andrew, your the one of the, one of my favorite sayings of yours is the tyranny of the deliverable. It's literally the tyranny of the deliverable. Yeah. I love it. I, I just think it's phenomenal because like, Everyone is so fixated on this little thing, this tiny little thing that provides an outcome. And I'm like, guys, you know, we could be, you don't need us to do this. You could be doing this yourselves. Yeah. Like, and, and, and that's the whole thing. I think the, the, even the concepts of the fixation on the app, I mean, that's like looking at one brick in a house, like looking at an app or fixating on the app is like looking at one brick. And I, I think a lot of the time, even me in the very beginning, like years ago, I, I failed to see the bigger picture. I get it now, but I've had to go through the pain of learning that actually the one thing is not the thing that matters. It's about enabling the people to do the one thing. And if you can enable millions of people to solve the problem themselves, rather than you trying to solve one problem for each of them, I think that changes this whole thing massively. But that goes back to the culpability and everything you just said there, Chris, which is actually a, lo a lot of partners have become technologists rather than consultants. And what I mean by that, which is the client will ask for something specifically and they go, yep, I'll build that for you rather than, well, are you sure you want to just focus on that brick? Or do you want to zoom out and focus on the whole house, the whole neighborhood, the whole the whole world as it would be? And I do think actually, you know, we we have, and, and that's the royal we, that, that's talking as Microsoft partners all up. We are to blame for a lot of that, for sure. You know, we need to go back to our purest consultancy roots, which is let's start enabling you appropriately and properly rather than just allowing you to focus on what you think is appropriate for you right now when we know it isn't. So to make that possible, to make that possible, I'm wondering is, 
<clears throat> are partners playing high enough inside the organizations they're consulting to? Because what you just talked about there is that if a client has come to you and asked for a thing to be built and you go in there and go, listen, you're looking at, as you say, this brick, but your data estate is shocking. And that the person that you're working with, the team that you're working with goes, that's not in my KPIs or that's not in my remit. That's, that's not my, or that's. Doesn't go in my p &L. Yeah. I only care about this brick. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like there's an element that it's not just, you know, for, and I'm not going to defend partners um, at all, but there's an element that the way organizations buy, and we had this a lot right when you get an RFP, RFI, um, it's like the worst way to buy on a feature tick, 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 right? Where other than what are you trying to do? And let's, let's unpack it. But that's the way people have been told that's how you assess three different solutions and make a, an informed choice. And, and, you know, get whatever, whatever comes. How do you move that conversation to a much higher level? Because when you talk about moving beyond the individual brick and solution, if we're going to get to the point where we can say to the AI that we have running an organization, uh, I need to this type of information presented, uh, inside teams. And it needs to be in a way that anybody that has privilege should be able to make this request. Right. And I'd expect that in the future, There'll be no such thing as low code. It'll all be no code, right? It will be that AI will have access to the entire data estate of the organization. It'll have access to all the different ways of interacting, honoring governance, permissions, et cetera, and go, boom, there it is. And you'll go, ah, Absolutely. I would like it to, and it will just alter on the fly to your requirements, right? That's what I see the future as being. How do you then, as an go back to that organization as in from that starting point and go, listen, at the moment, you've got a thousand data sets that sit in Excel that are part of your data estate that is unconnected, unconsumable. Then you've got three different SaaS solutions over here that has no API into your data estate, but have a big chunk of your, your, your data. How do you then have that discussion? I would like to build up on your question together with what you guys were saying earlier. I partially agree that this is the fault of partners who are keen on selling things really quickly, like easily resolvable uh, scenarios that will give us a quick return, that they focus on a deliverable, that they do mostly specialize on uh, workloads and whereas just a few years ago, maybe like five years ago, everyone was converging together in a DevOps cross-functional team scenario. Everyone just went siloed again in the chase for, well, profit. But I would like to build on Mark's question and say, do we fully believe that this is the partner's fault? Or is it the customer's fault as well, if, if not mainly? Aren't they the ones pushing their providers to go for a workload? Aren't they the ones making the provider and the partner scared that they're going to lose out on the business unless they take that Excel spreadsheet with a thousand data sets and just create a Canvas app on top of it to make it consumable? I think one of the things that I've really gotten into over the last couple of years in terms of you know, one of the hidden forces um, uh, that shapes a lot of behavior are incentives, right? So let's think about, let, Anna, let me depart a little bit from your question. Let's think about how most IT organizations inside of an, of an, or, of an end organization, not a partner, but a, an end customer are organized. Almost all of them are organized around specific pieces of technology, right? So you have a team that does RPA and you have a team that does infrastructure and a team that does productivity and a team that does app dev and on and on and on it goes, depending on how big the organization is. What so often happens is that from a budgeting perspective, the IT budget gets tied to a that to, a, to a number of baskets of requirements. And then they take the basket of requirements and they give it to the RPA team or to the app dev team or to the infrastructure team. 
Well, unsurprisingly, right, if you give a basket of requirements to the RPA team, you're going to get the thing that's made out of RPA. And you're going to get the thing that's made out of infrastructure and the thing that is made out of app dev, even if that is not the appropriate technological, technical or business solution. And the reason is because in organizations the world over, we have created the conditions, right? We've created the incentive structure for people to want to churn out deliverables, right? In order to win more budget, preserve their budget, et cetera, et cetera. And the same principle works for external partners as well. So external partners aren't haven't pushed this implement workload thing because they believed in it deeply in all cases. This is something that in a lot of cases has been pursued and has been pushed because the customer create has created an incentive structure that causes the partner to believe, rightfully so in many cases, this is the best way for us to be successful as a business. And that has to change. One of the things that is fair that I'm working in at the moment is this concept of digital literacy for the boards of organizations. Because what they do is they go, hey, we've got a CTO. We'll leave it with them to answer any of our tech issues. Or we've got a CIO, that type of, you know, type of role. And I believe that every board member that can influence millions, if not billions of dollars worth of budget need to have a level of digital literacy. So they don't know the answers, but they know how to ask the questions, right? Oh, spot on. Yeah. And I wonder that, you know, back to the questions that we had there, how high do we need to go to kind of get this the organizations to go, you know what, if we're going to be here at a certain point in five years' time or ten years' time, and when I look at where AI is going to go and what I'm researching and reading – five years and 10 years are going to be quantum leaps from where they are now. The flip side of it goes, yes, I can see it getting there, but then there's, I'm like, yeah, but these methandioles, that's not even the right word, in these organizations are so far behind. How are they going to, how are they going to make the right, their organizations there, or are we going to just see them disappear? They have to learn. They have to learn. I think that digital literacy needs to be at every level in the company. We're not in the 70s and 80s any longer where IT was like, oh, this is a cool thing. This is real and this is here and this is not going anywhere. It's the same thing as like, okay, let me give you an example. People, you know, so mathematics is compulsory in all schools, right? Um, why? It's compulsory because mathematics and counting is a fundamental part of our existence. We have to be able to count. We have to be able to know how to use numbers. Whether you're good at them or not is irrelevant. You need to know what a number is. And I think that is what is happening in IT today is right now. I think that to be a CEO, to be a CTO, to be a CIO, to be a CFO, you need to understand how technology works. And if you do not understand, I would question why you're in that role. That's just me. How do you define how technology works? You just said you need to know how technology works. How does it work? That's a great question. The way I'd define it is that you would put in certain kind of benchmarks. So think about karate, right? When people are learning to do karate, you get belts, you get graded. At school, you get graded, right? I think the same thing should happen here. I think that you should never be able to move into a CFO or CTO position until you understand the core concepts of the, the tech that's going on in your business. Like, why does data matter? Why do we care? The thing is, it's not a what question anymore. This is a why. And um, yeah, I think you can quite easily grade that. We do that in companies right now with makers. You've got a company with 45,000 makers. They need to be graded. I would never let maker A, who's Bob from, you know, I don't know, customer service, build in a certain place because I don't trust them and I don't want them to touch my data. Mm. And I think up to the C level, it's the same thing. And folks, this is the fundamental problem that we've got here is that the people in the senior levels don't know how to make the right decisions based on the education that they've been given. I think that the the nature of what I, 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 we don't want, I don't want to sit here and hate on most of these these folks who are in these no, sorts no, no, of roles no, 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 because no. I think the nature of leading one of these institutions, whether I keep saying institution, I mean whether it's a private company or whether it's a, a government agency or or whatever it might be, it's really fundamentally changed. And I think back to um, I worked at Microsoft partner called AIS, Applied Information Sciences, from um, you know roundabouts 
2017 to, to 2021. And I remember the first time I was in a big company meeting and the CEO uh, there, a great guy, Larry Katzman, he was talking all about this back in 2017, about how every company needs to be a software company. Every company needs to become a software company. And I think that I didn't realize at the time how correct that was going to be. Um, and I had big arguments with people because I was a believer when I heard it, right? But I had big arguments with people that, no, 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 you need to focus on your core business. And looking back on that now, it seems preposterous, really, right? That anyone could focus on their core business without mastering the technology that uh, increasingly enables them to do that core business. So it's a huge reorientation of what the purpose of the firm is and what the role of that executive leader is as a technology leader, even when you're not in a prototypical technology company. And let's face it, every really good, I mean, really good digital transformation, if we can say that there has been some really good ones, because there has been, okay, there are some ones that, you know, come to front of mind. Oh, yeah. Always have an executive sponsor at the top. And the great ones are the ones that actually have the CEO pushing, you know, they're pushing forward along with a lot of the other board members as well. And coming back to that digital literacy comment, I could not agree more. It's the customers when I when I meet with their board members that start quoting Forrester and Gartner as their point of education. Let's face it, we're all busy people, so are they, and they may be specialists in other areas, but the fact that they can sit down and at least have an understanding of interest around what is currently going on, where they think it's going, sitting down with their peers, asking you what's industry best practice that you've seen in other areas that, and clients that you've worked with. They're the ones that are normally ready to engage in a much higher level and are ready to learn and actually be, you know, slightly molded, but you can also learn from because it's, it's a really interesting space. I like your point on uh, every company should be a software company, and I think we're moving into the fact that every company will soon be an AI company as well. Yeah, you know, they're yeah. all going to have their own specially trained models. And a lot of them that I'm starting to speak with now are starting to go, wait a minute, we have a real product here. You know, we could end up just actually removing ourselves from the industry and supplying the industry with this product. And we're starting to see that, which is just fantastic. I noticed one of the 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 interesting things in ChatGPT last week was introduced this concept of uh, customer instruction which is where I can say, hey, I'm always Mark. I always live here. I'm basically a whole bunch of stuff about me. This is my role title. This is who I work for, blah, 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 blah. Now, every time I ask it a question, it does it in context of that, right? It's been predicted within 12 months, we'll all have LLMs, uh, the full model on our mobile phones, right? Yeah. Not There's been rumors yeah. that yeah. Apple's making that yeah. as well. And so therefore, we are going to be able to, of course, give it our own data and it'll be incredibly powerful now we take that same model and look at organizations the problem is where's the data uh-huh so mark i consider you actually an expert in the field and i'm going to tell you why we were at a conference in 2018 and you were um actually walking around with a camera and a whole setup thing uh, interviewing people asking them for their opinion. And the question of the day was, what are your ambitions for next year? Uh, and you were, you were just asking everyone that. Uh, executives of Microsoft, partners, everyone. Then it was your turn to say, what did you think the future was? And you said, AI and VR. Who said that? You. Oh, man, I never remember what I said. Your hey. person actually said <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said next year and what I'm focusing from now on, yep. this is the thing that's coming in 2018. Mm -hmm. I do remember So that. because we're talking about ways right now, I'm super curious to see, based on your experience and the companies you have been working with, how did they actually cope with the technology waves? Did anyone else see this coming? We've talked about the doom and gloom quite a lot, you know, how people are going to fail without data. How are they going to succeed with data? It's going to be interesting. I think that if you could take the, I'll give you an example, actually. Let's say a large petroleum company that I'm aware of that's been going for around 100 years. They've been able to go and mine all their data, take all their paper, everything from schematics, everything, and bring it into 
a consumable format. And they've been able to tap into engineers that used to work for the company 30 years ago and are no longer there, but they're, because they were in an industry where everything had to be captured, everything had to be documented, they've now been able to take what was paper-based captured then, digitize it, and are learning so much stuff about how to build forward because they've not lost the body of knowledge from all those incredibly knowledgeable engineers through their history. I think that when any when organizations really understand that and, and and assemble their data in a format that is cataloged and usable, and what I mean by cataloged is that if you go into a supermarket and they didn't put any any of the food in the same location, they didn't put the breakfast cereals there, they didn't put the fruit and veg there, every time you went, it was just wherever the person felt like chucking them on the shelves, you'd pretty quickly stop using that supermarket, right? Because you wouldn't know where to find the things that you wanted. And so I think organizations have to go through one, are bringing their data and making it all um, accessible, whether it's via APIs, whether it's in um, fabric, with whatever. They need to bring it together uh, or they need to make it accessible. And then the second thing, I think they need to catalog it and to, to really then drill into it. I think any organization that really does that, they will they will outstrip every competitor. By, by miles, because what they'll be able to do is be able to take not just their data sets. So once they've got that, they'll be able to then consume public data sets and understand what the impact of a business happening on the other side of the world will have on their business and what consumer trends or behaviors are changing. They'll be able to take those external data feeds and therefore enrich their own decision-making processes around engaging with, with future market ops. So for the first time after several, after two decades at least of talking about knowledge management, we're actually going to have knowledge management, AI to the <laughs> AI to the rescue. Yeah. yeah. I am the artificial intelligence and I am here to save 2004's biggest tech trend. Nice. I, I think that's great. That's a great example. It, it, it is. It is amazing. So I do, I do a session on data quite a lot in the community and, um, when you actually go into things like ChatGPT and that, you ask, why do we capture data? You're going to get a number, like a, a plethora of random things. But actually, the reason we capture data is to make more accurate business decisions faster, right? Like that's the only reason we do it. And um, I think, Mark, you've hit the nail on the head, man. Like if you could predict where your business was going to go, your buying cycles, the product cycles, the propensity modeling, you know, I mean, you, that you could do anything. And the thing that makes me laugh so much is that every company in this world has got huge amounts of data, but they're their own worst enemy because of politics. And it goes back to your original question that you asked. You said, like, what is the thing that's really stopping us? And it's the companies themselves. Like, they don't have enough education. And the problem is, is that everyone's so busy land grabbing and holding on to their little area. But actually, if they just realized, hey, you know what? We're just going to share this stuff. And I think it's slowly happening. Like, if you look at... So they're, you know, some of the fire services and, and the local governments in, in the UK, like they're not competitive and they're quite happy to share information because they're like, look, you know, if this is going to help us save lives, this is a really good way to use data. So the opportunity is there. It's just people are so fixated on their own little thing. Man, it drives me nuts. Like I actually get upset about it because this could really change the way people live, work, everything. Yeah. You, you just need to take a look at the airline industry to see why the the concept of flight and and moving from country to country via air travel is so has grown so much in really a short amount of time it's because every accident has to be fully investigated and everybody gets to learn from it nobody gets to go no we're not going to say how that plane went down right everybody has to learn from it it's not it's not a thing about you know um controlling the data and therefore only i learn from it right it's about safety of everybody and I think we need, yeah, models more like that, which, I mean, they're screaming out in, in security, right? That that if you have a security breach, I saw something the other day that you got three days to report it to, otherwise you can be sanctioned with a heap of fines. And because I, I think there would be a lot less security risk if there'd been a lot more, hey, we, we got breached and this is how they did it and let's tighten up in these areas. But of course, what happens? We got breached. Don't tell anybody, right? We don't want anybody to know. Crazy crazy yeah man i just i really i really think that in this era now 
you know, I think Will said, like, people, this is not a case in point of, oh, we think we can change. And, we, you know, the digital transformation thing, it's like, okay, we don't really need to do digital transformation. We're going to skip out and like doing digital stuff and we're just going to capture things on paper and carry on the way we are, they are. In this wave, I believe that if people don't do something, they're screwed. This is not a this is not a case in point of like you can skip this wave. Their competitors will have an unfair advantage for all the right reasons that actually adopt this. And you know, and that's as simple as it is. They will so have fair they advantage. have all the cheap <laughs> Yeah, it's a fair it's a fair advantage, but they will see it as unfair as well. And I was, yeah, I played with that in my head a couple of times, Andrew, but I think actually saying unfair advantage almost has more impact because they will see it as unfair because they will be able to have more productivity better decision-making and actually more autonomy, which will allow them to, you know, accelerate beyond belief, quite frankly. And that's, you know, going back to that, that the example I gave at the beginning, which is check, look into that because that's one of the key things that allowed them to be left behind, which was you can't keep up with just large language models in general, where I think actually if they were ready, they had everything, to, you know, together, their data together, their infrastructure, everything was interconnected. They could have became a super house of education. Mm -hmm. That's what we're starting to see now. So sorry, I was, I was listening in awe of some some of the uh, the opinions, but uh, yeah, fantastic. I was going to say that I think that we really are going to see more and more of a two tier economy emerge, right? So this is a, a a a sad story, and it's also a happy story, depending on which side of it you're on. You know, where the organizations, the institutions that invest in this next in this wave, and the institutions that take it seriously and really importantly, are willing to do the hard work, right? Yes, you need capital, you need financing to be able to do some of this. But a lot of it is about organizational will. And the organizations with the organiz the, the folks with the organizational will, I think are going to more readily find themselves in the tier of the economy that really is able to take off and do things that they haven't thought of before. Uh, now, unfortunately, for the the bottom tier, I, I think all the time about the fable of the frog being boiled. If you stick yeah. the frog in boiling water, um, the frog will jump out. But if you stick the frog in just warm water and then gradually turn up the temperature, and that is what is going to happen to a lot of institutions, a lot of organizations out there, is that they are not going to realize that they're finished until it is too late to do anything about it. Mm. Um, that's the real fear over the next several years. Yeah. One of the things that we, we started here it was around the failures of digital transformation. Have we really put that to bed? What, what, what other, what can we learn from it? And, and why, like, I just even look in my, my LinkedIn profile and my title is, is I help organization digitally transform. You know, um, yeah. where, 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 where are you, where are we really at? Um, where are we really at as an, in that digital transformation story? I think that we are still obsessed with technology and not with people. I'll tell you why I think I failed. In the, I don't think it failed. I just don't think it did the right, it did it as well as we, it could have. But like when this whole thing came around, so if you look at, at like the clock sticks over in 2000 and everyone was like, oh shit, IT is here to stay, right? Like the big, the big double zero didn't destroy everything. Cool. Like, let's put our seatbelts on and get strapped in for this thing. With the acceleration up until about 2010, 2012, when Capgemini came up with the term digital transformation, it was this fixation on tech. It's like Microsoft releasing huge amounts of technology, Google releasing huge amounts of technology, same with Apple, without governance, without thoughts of, like, actual outcome. Let's do cool stuff as fast as we can to beat everyone. But nobody thought about enabling people. Right. Everyone was just like, OK, and that's why we have a developer shortage. That's why we have people that aren't technically educated. And that's a problem. OK. And I think we're in this wave now where people have kind of thought, OK, we figured it out. And then when 2014 came around with low code and Forrester coining that term, they were like, OK, well, we've kind of broken this thing. Let's see if we can maybe do something better. So low codes here and we're enabling people, but we still haven't told them how to do anything. We're still focusing on, hey, that's a power app. Hey, it's a flow. Hey, AI. But not like. How do we really enrich somebody's existence as with technology as a catalyst? And I feel like in this era now that we're coming into, and I'm watching, I'm watching people like Google and Microsoft, or even Ryan Cunningham, he gets on stage, he's like, he's not talking about power apps anymore. He's talking about maker movements and people and how we can help them. And I think that that is key. And like I said before, 
the companies that don't climb onto this make a movement thing, this ecosystem enablement thing, are still going to be fixated on tech and they won't have the people to help them. In my opinion, enabling people has been um, quite a challenge for me in multiple jobs because I love the idea of enabling people. I do not love the idea of not educating people. It feels like people were actually able for a long time, granted not with Power Apps or with Power Automate or with local tools, but they did have Excel and they did have like folders and categorization systems and so on and so forth. We started to digitally transform those processes and those ecosystems. But unfortunately, we didn't fully understand the scale at which our friends and colleagues would be enabled to freely take on data and run with it in a way that we couldn't catch up. I really love what Mark said earlier when he said, you know, you're going to lose the value created by these brilliant engineers. And these brilliant engineers have been working with macros in Excel. And you're like, oh, whatever, we're just going to digitally transform and create that bit. But we're not going to invest in actually understanding fully what the process does. We're just going to do whatever we feel like the end result should be, but we're not going to go deep enough. And therefore we're going to lose a bunch of data or we are going to store it even less structured than in Excel. And that's where people missed out on the truth of digital transformation. Digital transformation doesn't mean that you're, you get to fire 50% of your staff and become more profitable. It means that you really take the time to understand what your processes are and understand the fact that 90% of what you want to do, you can do in the cloud and you don't need an RPA bot for it. I was going to say, in the end, that's, I, I love the point there. In, a, to, in the end, digital transformation needs to be about growth, not about efficiency. Yes, you will realize efficiencies, but your focus, the eye, the eye you need to have on the ball should not be about cost savings. It should be about expanding the pie rather than carving it up more finely. It's hard because, and what Anna said there is around when you create efficiencies that you can then lay off staff. And I think this is the fundamental problem with capitalism as in, it goes into that realm, right? Which is that if you've got a factory and you've got a hundred workers, and they're producing a product at a, at a rate. And then all of a sudden this, the, the owner goes, you know what? I heard that I can get a robot in and it can do everything at the same rate, but I can do it with 50 cent, 50% of the number of people. What does a capitalist do? Great. That's money in my pocket. And an alternative view would be, guess what? We will keep the full 100% of staff, but we'll reduce their work hours to only 50% of the time, right? So they still get paid the same. Everybody benefits from this new technology. But this is, I said this to my accountant, he went nuts. Oh, but that the owners had to invest <laughs> in all this kind of stuff. The shareholders. The shareholders. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, that's the problem with capitalism, right? The money flows only to the top, and it screws everybody that's, that's down below. And I think there's, you know, I know this is slightly side conversation and it might make me a, a you know, but, get tired. But it with... screws the top as yeah, well. Yeah. That's what we're saying. Yeah. Like we thought it benefits the top and for what, for a short while, stakeholders did get their return immediately. But unless they retired and bought their yachts, they're not yeah. boiling slowly. Yeah. Because we are seeing that digital transformation and the wave of technology, because I'm just going back to the waves that have been much, um, much slower and less powerful in the past, 
everyone's just got everyone's being swallowed by a tsunami right now unless they do take a step back so in my opinion we must now take a step back and recognize the fact both partners and customers recognize the fact that it's time to invest it's time to invest in talent in people um and in time for people to reconcile <laughs> like we we kept saying low code or no code pro code unite and now is the time to actually do it because um you know otherwise like you guys were saying earlier you, we have all this power and all of these ai engines and we do not have the data and we will not have the data for it to create new systems for us and i absolutely agree with you Anna. and and the, the key word the most salient word out of all of that was reconcile and i think reconciliation is the key part here which is you know i i really want to stop using the word digital transformation i think it's it, we're, we're now in re-digital transformation thanks to covid with the over investment in actually low code and portals sure. and all the other things that they create and teams and zoom and and puppies and dogs because you just brought them because you're alone for two years you know we, we suddenly are getting into re re digital transformation and actually reconciles the key part which is that when you look at the stats all companies know that they need to get a lot of companies know that's a strong strong statement a lot of companies know that data gravity is the key to success a lot of companies know that actually it yields significant dividends for them when they have an intelligent data platform where everything's feeding in appropriately but because they've already done it once or maybe even twice and done it so inappropriately and incorrectly that they're just worried about doing it again so i love the word reconcile and that was a bit of a sweeping statement but i do think that's where we're at so we're moving towards that enablement journey we could move a lot faster but reconciliation has to happen and i really like that point and i think that's fantastic will you've used the word data gravity twice and i have no idea what that means no one knows what it means it just gets the people going mark that's all <laughs> No, no, it's uh, <laughs> it's in, in my view, it's it's the ability to ensure that all these siloed, segregated, dispersed data around your 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 data landscape and and you know if they are segregated, this poor data landscape can be interconnected, brought together, validated, mapped appropriately, and be pulled so you can use it appropriately, knowing that the data you've got in that in in that large lake in that large pool is appropriate to use, and it's constantly being fed, it's constantly being pushed through and then what that enables you to do is be more agile it allows you to be, make these reports it allows you to add statistical layers models intelligent layers on top of that and actually report your data outwards so instead of having it all flooded around you're just streaming it all into a central location in, in you know but and, and having that gravity type approach with it nice andrew i was gonna say do we need a list oh, for this this ongoing podcast series we need a list of banned words and it sounds like digital transformation <laughs> It's got it. That's going to go in the bin. Like b banned words and, and potentially banned topics, right? If my brother-in-law hears the segment about Mark Smith hating on capitalism, it's going to be a flame mark on the ceiling yeah. above his head. So <laughs> the irony is he's surnamed Smith and he's uh, must be related to Adam Smith somehow. <laughs> so this obviously draws us to a natural conclusion as in what we've been discussing over the, the last couple of episodes. Tell me, you know, how do we want the community to interact with this series that we're doing? What are, what are we seeking? Are we seeking feedback? Are we seeking um, other ideas, opinions to come on? What, what are your guys' thoughts? Yeah, defo feedback. I think um, we've already started to see some of the lingo being used across across places like LinkedIn and that. So people have actually put themselves out as ecosystem architects and things which is quite cool. Um, I think w feedback would be amazing, right? Like real world feedback, not, oh, I think this is a great idea. I think it would be cool. You know, this is where I think it will work and why that type of feedback. And then obviously, I think also just getting getting other opinions, getting folks on, even people that disagree, I think it'd be good, yeah. right? Because I think we need to hammer this out. And I think if we don't, we're going to be a bit of in a bit of trouble in the future. So yeah, I would really, really love it if other folks would join in. Yeah, so you can do that by contacting any one of us individually. We're all, of course, on LinkedIn. In the show notes, there will be references to us to find us. Um, but, yeah, we'd absolutely value other opinions than just our own. What would you like to see on the show? What would you like us to talk about? 
Um, I was thinking that there's a, a one little thing to wrap up, and I'd like to go around everybody. And so the first person that's going to get this question, of course, is going to have a disadvantage to the last person that gets the question. But what's the kind of top three, three things on your radar at the moment? What are you thinking about? And I don't care if this is personal in the news and or in your business lives. But um, starting with you, Will, what are those top three things? The disadvantage is coming quick. <laughs> Just give me a moment, <laughs> Mr. Smith. Because <laughs> right now I'm thinking about going to sleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so a, a key thing for me is is the common thread that we've, we've all pushed, which is ecosystem enablement. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris and I, is all we speak about, is actually how do we st start – getting people to zoom out from that 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 one brick approach mm -hmm. and we know it's hard we know it's political we know it's incentivized but starting to, to start looking at the entire house as a whole and so i'm going okay how do i enable everybody in this household to, to work and start building and enabling what they need to rather than just that single part of it um another part for me has it's got to be uh ai it's got to be data science but my biggest worry with that is when democratization comes inertia follows so you go, oh, but how does that work? Well, I, I just I just type in that prompt. Yeah, but how does it work? Oh, I click that button. And I worry, actually, if we don't start educating on how data science works, how these models mm -hmm. work appropriately and give people a base level of understanding, which has been a thread in this show, which is education, then actually a lot of people could be at risk, not just uh, a, a, a business risk, but actually even consumers with their, their personalized, you know, iPhone large language model that then gets thrown out into the wild and they had no idea which data it was processing and how it was processing mm. and then third well um third what what would i go for third uh i like why i'm asking myself questions now that's how <laughs> that's how deep i've got into this podcast uh do you know the other part is actually something that just plays on my mind, and and you you covered it uh, a moment ago, Mark, uh, which is you know your 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 look into the future, which was where you 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 would have this this computer, and you're just asking, hey, I want to create a marketing list uh, from any contact that likes the color red and likes going to the zoo, and it just brings it to you. you go, okay, now I want to report on that. Now create this email mm -hmm, with mm -hmm, this view. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious about the development of user interfaces and fluid user interfaces with that. Because I think it's one thing that really needs to be reinvented. And if you look at the way we use, you know, chat GPT, it's a slightly different search engine type mm -hmm. approach. But as we further that, as we start becoming more multimodal, as we start becoming more centered around the fluid design where it can bring anything onto the screen, I'm curious of how us as people who have been around for a long time will adopt that sort of user experience and interface. And I'm, I'm curious to see where that goes. Nice. So that's been a bit of a focus of mine as well. And everything that comes with that, including, of course, accessibility. Nice. And that's it. Andrew. Well, aside from uh, investing in a new webcam that isn't going to spend half the show, the next episode blurry, <laughs> I, I suppose if I did not say that the number one thing on my mind right now is the fact that, uh, uh, Anna and I are going to have a proper wedding in September. I probably wow. would uh, Congratulations. really have been <laughs> well done. Really have been leaving something out. That's so yeah. cool. Um, so you, the, the rest of you guys are going to have to find your own podcast uh, podcast co host for that period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, yeah, I would I would say that um, uh, other things on my mind. First of all, um, when I was at the uh, when I was at the Microsoft MVP Summit in Redmond back in April, one of the things that really struck me was how everyone went to the sessions that aligned with their own track. Okay, so the biz apps folks went to the biz app sessions and the. Uh, data platform folks went to the data platform sessions and, you know, on and on it went. And I took it upon myself to go to sessions that were um, not in my own track. And I found myself, I was in there with Matt's Necker a lot. Like we were just in session after session looking at other people's tech. Uh, you went to PowerPoint sessions. You went to how to use OneNote. Oh, yeah, and, the PowerPoint uh, Yeah, no, I get you. <laughs> Plan, planner, planner, nice. PowerPoint is my favorite <laughs> power product. All right. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I So first, on the technology front, first and foremost, learn about things that are outside of your area of expertise. Make those things your area of expertise, right? Because the 
kind of architecture and the kind of solutions that I think are taking more and more prominence, and I'll talk about this as my third thing in a moment, are those that connect with and use um, the technology around them. So you can't, if, if you're not conversant in quote unquote other people's tech, then you're not going to do well. Uh, you're not going to do well in this area. So branch out and, and don't be afraid to experiment and don't think that you can solve all of uh, all of the problems that face you just using the technology that you know really well. So do that. And I think that for organizations, what I'm most, what I have most on my mind is that organizations need to move away from this fixation on implementing workloads that we've talked about and focus more on architecting the strategic foundations of their cloud estate. And in particular, what is it that they are hoping to achieve through the use of cloud technology um, that's going to drive uh, business value and that's going to drive business results? So a transition away from the um, end, from the pointy end of the spear, from that point solution, and a re-emphasis or an emphasis maybe for the first time on letting technology strategy drive your technology decisions and building platform ecosystems that you have a high degree of confidence can solve 80% of the problems that you're going to face. So you're never going to be future proofed. That needs to go on the banned word list, future proofing. But you can be future ready. Mm. And that is what I think the biggest value of taking this ecosystem approach that the five of us are going to be talking about is building a future ready organization uh, for a very, very unpredictable, uh, unpredictable time. Nice. Anna. Okay. Three things um, on my mind. I can confirm Andrew and I are getting married. Uh, <laughs> like, like Will said earlier, COVID produced a lot of puppies. Um, we, we had a kid instead. Um, and now he's going to make an honest woman out of me. <laughs> it's going to be confusing to a lot of people since we already refer, like I already say, oh, this is my wife, Anna. Yeah, so. more, more, like, <laughs> more like you'll make an honest man out of him, I think, will be the, the situation. Yeah. <laughs> and congratulations, yes, guys. Yes. Honestly, so awesome. <laughs> so we're going to do that. Um, and then, you know what? My life is really complicated. It's just so complicated and every day I feel like I have to explain what I do what we should be doing mm -hmm. and almost defend the position of um, taking a broader approach than, than just one technolo technological discipline so the second thing that is uh, within my focus for this year will be making friends. I want to make a lot of friends who are experts in many, many areas, take one thing that they do and then explain it really simply to someone else who doesn't do what they do at all. That's my approach to ecosystem architecture. Nice. Making friends and helping people reconcile. A little bit, yeah. So this this is my this is my second very important thing that I want to focus on this year. And finally, but not less importantly, I will choose uh, a technological subject, and for me that is data. Very likely fa fabric, uh -huh. because I believe that this is the convergence of all data, and this is how we're actually gonna try to and then start setting up routes for successful organizations who are going to be able to use artificial intelligence. So yeah, nice. those are my three things. I love it. Mr. Huntingford. Yeah, right. Three things. So number one, moving cross stack properly. So I already do some cross stack stuff, but um, we invented a thing called the digital tripod <laughs> and it's a focus on data security and not just low code, but a mechanism to surface that stuff, right? So that's going to be a big deal. I feel like it's probably going to be my next 10 years, right? Like that's that's what I reckon. So that's one. Uh, number two, I'll probably have to say growing the practice at ANS. Like 
you know, on the ecosystem architecture front, not just on making apps and things like that, but really, really growing it into a full on movement. I was saying to our CEO the other day, like, we are not a tech company that has a movement. We are a movement that has a tech company, right? And like, I think that this is much wider than just us. So yeah, defo, defo those two. And I think the third thing, right, is it's going to sound a bit crazy, but maybe to step back a little bit and uh, not just from like events and things, but from the community in general and just take a little bit of time because like I've, I've sold my soul to it to an extent. So now I feel like I want to, I want to move back a bit and like just hang out, enjoy our new house, hang out with my pals. I love it. And the, the fam. Yeah. So that's my three. Nice. Nice. So Mark, I was going to say, what is your three? Yeah. <laughs> What's your so, three? So a big one on mine is digital literacy. How do we, you know, they say a rising tide floats all boats. How do we bring everybody's literacy up no matter whether it's the the janitor the cleaner the the reception everybody in organization how do we lift that as an in a way that is not like a forced thing oh you need to learn this like um uh you know it's like compulsory training you know that you skip through the videos to the end and go yeah i watched it you know but how do you actually raise the digital temperature for everybody the second thing um is on my radar is robots um, I've got my first robot lawnmower and I'm absolutely obsessed with it. Um, my, my property just looks like it's never done in its entire history. When you have a robot that works 24 seven, making sure every blade of grass is at the right height and you know, amazing. And then of course that leads me on to nanobots. And when will we be in a position? that I never have to shave again because in my sleep, a nanobot takes care of every hair follicle on my body, including in my ears and nose and every other crevice <laughs> that, that I might not want here. You know, when am I gonna, <laughs> when am I gonna have the nanobot that lives in my mouth that keeps my oral hygiene at absolutely pristine condition? When I'm gonna have a nanobot that sits inside my body and, and removes all fat cells that are unproductive to my health, including all, you know, uh, chemical loads, et cetera, and, and bring my body into a, a pristine space. I'm, I'm looking forward to nanobots. I, I want to, I think there's a lot of roles that they could do. Um, it was interesting this week. I called my, um, you know, when people say, will technology replace people? My guy that mows my lawns, he mows them from the perspective of getting the job done, right? He doesn't give a shit how it looks. <laughs> That's the deliverable. <laughs> when I started my career, I was a groundskeeper for my first three years of my career of a prestigious school. Within three months of, of starting that job, I became the head groundskeeper. Um, and I like grass to look mean. I don't like it messy. And I called him up this week and said, uh, I've bought my own mower and no longer need your assistance. And that robot has fully replaced his job because <laughs> it is just perfect. The quality is just like, and we're not talking about incremental quality. We're talking about quantum quality of difference. <laughs> we need pictures, Mark. You need to upload pictures to this podcast. Yeah. I don't know what I find more interesting, Mark's fixation on his lawn or the fact that he's concerned that he might have too much hair at some point <laughs> in the future. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's all about cutting. It's all about cutting. <laughs> Removing the excess. Yes. Mark, yes. I absolutely feel your pain with, um, with jobs done just to be completed. Um, um, <laughs> So Andrew's mom just got her house redone and I went in and I was be like, well, that's be crooked and that's not centered. Mm -hmm. And this is like, I know that it all works and it looks better than before, but it's not centered. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. none of the... Mm -hmm. <sighs> There was a requirement for a shower, but there was no requirement that said that the shower handle needed to be centered on the wall. Okay. <laughs> like, write better requirements. 
<laughs> oh lord. So um yes, nanobots are actually gonna replace some things because some things need to be just so. Yeah, they need to be centered <laughs> and the grass needs to be cut properly. <laughs> hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 Guy. If there's a guest you'd like to see on the show, please message me on LinkedIn. If you want to be a supporter of the show, please check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365 Guy. Stay safe out there and shoot for the stars. <laughs>